And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Roleplay Elixir. Crit and creator of the upcoming 5e campaign, Caravea Victor. The one and only Mehmet, <laughs> Mehmet Batuan. And I, I almost flubbed it. <laughs> yeah, you got it right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no better way of saying it. Mehmet mm -hmm. Batuan is mm -hmm. the uh, correct way. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for having me as a guest. Yep. So... Time time zone hell aside, how how have, how have you how have you been doing lately? Um, I'm very fine, uh, thank you. Um, I'm living in Turkey, and uh, we have been in total lockdown for uh, like a month. Uh, for one month, uh, all the shops were closed, all the you know, workplaces, uh, many many of the. Uh, factories, apart from those essential ones, uh, were closed. Uh, people people were all at home, and uh, there were uh, there was a really uh, hard process of uh, vaccination here. Uh, but uh, as of this week, uh, finally, we have come out of lockdown. Uh, everywhere is uh, pretty much open again. So yes, to today and today, uh, nearly after. Uh, one and a half uh, year, uh, I was able to go to my local gaming store, uh, my local hobby uh, hobby store, and I I played a war game, uh, miniature war game. Well, it was it was fascinating for me. It was awesome. Uh, I really missed it. I really missed to see my friends. I really missed to throw dice and play with my uh, miniatures. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm really happy today. <laughs> yeah. So I tend to f I tend to focus early on on the well humble beginnings. So with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick. Okay. Uh, I met role playing game. I'm, I'm by the way 33 years old, and uh, I met role playing games in uh, while I was in high school. Um, my like in computer as of, as of computer games, uh, I maybe Icewind Dale and uh, mm -hmm. Baldur's Gate uh, were maybe the first ones I played, uh, and uh, then came the others. Then uh, came like uh, Morrowind, uh, mm -hmm. other scroll series, um, but yes, tabletop RPG uh, was also. Uh, I was introduced to tabletop RPG uh, by my friends who were playing. Uh, they were actually older than me. Uh, mm -hmm. These guys were playing advanced uh, D and D. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we tried it a few times. Uh, at first years, I was just a player and. Uh, I was happy to play with them, but uh, then they graduated from the high school, and I was like the G DM of my uh, gaming group, mm -hmm. uh, of my friends. So then in university, uh, I I was interested in uh, also uh, war games, miniature war games. Uh, mm -hmm. I started collecting armies. Uh, I had a huge uh, Bretonian army from uh, Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, then I delved into Warhammer 40k. Uh, I collected and still I own a lot of uh, Dark Eldar. These days I think they are called Drukari. Uh, I'm still calling them Dark Eldar no matter what GW says. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I still... Uh, I still love and mm -hmm. own my uh, Drukari and Dark Elder army. Uh, then, um, yeah, I am very much into history also. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started collecting also historical miniatures. Uh, I played a lot of 
uh, Flames of War. I have a lot of uh, Soviet miniatures. Then we started collecting uh, Roman uh, and Carthaginian and uh, Greek and Macedonian uh, miniatures. Uh, so we started playing mm -hmm. these eras. Uh, and at the same time, of course, I was always playing uh, one uh, tabletop RPG or another. I, for, yeah, D and D. It's uh, maybe uh, the I I've been playing D and D uh, for a lot of times, but uh, also uh, I tried a lot of games from uh, old World of Darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hunter the Vigil being my favorite, uh, and then Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, also some others so uh, it evolved like this and uh, so at some point uh, I became uh, one of the uh, uh, like the core members of the local uh, of my local gaming club uh, there here we have local conventions mm -hmm. uh, and uh, game days where people are introduced to uh, tabletop RPGs, uh, where players that have never played on a table uh, come, sit, and uh, for the first time uh, we give them character sheets, we mm -hmm. tell about uh, adventures, uh, we tell about fantasy role-playing games, uh, and they roll dice, we, we try to uh, tell how it works, uh, and yeah, most of the time, maybe they are uh, they love what they see, but uh, after some time, their interest fades away. Uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes they join us, and uh, it's very good to see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I may be going away from the uh, question, but uh, yeah, uh, as time went on, I became one of the core members of my uh, local gaming club. I'm I'm made uh, many friends there, uh, which still I play tabletop RPGs. And uh, that's pretty much how I started and uh, then got into the hobby more and more. Yeah. Now, that, br that brings me to Carovia Victor. Um, yes. Carovia Victor. What... Was um, you mentioned now? You mentioned that you you mentioned that you did have a bit of a bit of leaning towards being a historical buff, um, but something I'm curious about was 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 CV a pro a project that you deve that um developed from just your experiences at the t at the table? Was this a campaign setting you were already running about and um in gr in um groups beforehand? And um, as you said, uh, history was uh, always a great uh, point of interest for me. And um, in time, uh, we we started to think, uh, what what can we do uh, to maybe uh, play um, a tabletop RPG uh, that takes place in ancient Rome or ancient Greece uh, or or can we play a game where maybe like minotaurs uh, from a Greek island mm -hmm. uh, raid uh, a settlement uh, in Greece and uh, heroes try to uh, heroes try to fight them, save the settlement, uh, etc. So um, we were already homebrewing some uh, rules and some uh, um, ideas. Uh, we were homebrewing. Uh, adventure uh, sets and uh, like classes uh, we were trying to make subclasses for it mm -hmm. uh, and then it it just uh, we, it was like uh, after the uh, covid uh, lockdowns were effective uh, yeah we, we were uh, we, we missed playing very much uh, and then we said yeah we, we should we should write them all down uh, we should write them in uh, a proper uh, orderly manner so mm -hmm. uh, we can um, we can develop them 
uh, we can present them to the people. Uh, and then a few of our friends told us, yeah, why don't you open it up on Kickstarter or uh, why don't you uh, tell people about what you do? And that's when things started to get serious. Uh, uh, we, uh, we published uh, very small adventures, uh, a very small subclass uh, options uh, from mm -hmm. our personal pages. Uh, and then we said, yeah, this, this, is, this is definitely a great thing to do. This, uh, why didn't we do this earlier? This is what we want to do. Uh, and maybe hopefully uh, we want this to become our full-time jobs uh, if, if we can get it right. Uh, so that, uh, that opened the way to role-play Elixir. Uh, mm -hmm. At first, we were not very sure about uh, the, uh, the we, we were not very sure about the Roman setting. We were uh, we wanted to do something historical, blend fantasy into history. That's mm -hmm. exactly what we wanted to do. Um, but then, as things progressed, we said uh, yes. Uh, we we uh, came to the conclusion that we needed to focus. Uh, on the Roman side of things, uh, that's what we uh, want to um, explore more because, uh, like ancient Greece, is uh, something already a little bit explored in the D and D. Um, mm -hmm. Many people uh, have done some settings or uh, homebrewed uh, monsters or adventure uh, sets that would reflect the uh, Greek uh, mythology mm -hmm. uh, and that brings Greek mythology to D&D. &D. Uh, and we said, yeah, uh, the Roman side is a little bit missing. And um, maybe it's, it's not very much uh, mythological and it may not give us uh, many resources uh, as in the Greek uh, mythology. Uh, but the Roman history is um, actually very various and uh, in terms of battles and in terms of uh, struggles of the ancient world, uh, mm -hmm. it gives us a great, uh, a great potential uh, to develop it. Mm -hmm. uh, so then... Uh, after a few adventures, after a few, like I said, subclasses, all uh, all inspired from uh, mythology, uh, we then turned to uh, explore more uh, Rome, and that was the beginning of our Caravio Victor adventure. Now, something that I do fi something that I do find interesting because. I do recall that there was a, that there was a um, ro that there was a Rome themed five um, E campaign setting that came, that came out. Well it's, well, it's not out yet, but it but it was kick it was kickstarted about about a year ago. Um, but that one was trying to play things relatively straight, whereas you whereas you guys well just on just on the cover alone you have a bat you have a battlefield that involves a dragon and a giant centipede. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so one thing I'm cu one thing I'm curious about is did did it start did it start out as you, as you guys being relatively low key with with um with trying to bring Rome to 5e or were, or did you guys intend on going gonzo from from the word go? Um when when we first uh, thought of uh, blending uh, Rome into fantasy, um, uh, we we actually uh, thought about how to uh, how to do it properly, and um, yeah, we came to the conclusion that uh, we need to uh, we need to give a proper setting. We we can't just uh, tell the people. Uh, yeah, there, there are some subclasses that we write, like mm -hmm. uh, we have written a gladiator subclass. Go use it in your games. How you use it or where you use it, um, I don't know. Just uh, do what you want with it. Okay, that's, that's a cool thing to say, maybe. 
but if we are to really improve ourselves and if we are to uh, if we we'll want people to uh, get uh, deep uh, into what we what we imagine uh, that's that's that is uh, something we need to give to the people that and that is a setting mm -hmm. uh, so we started uh, thinking about um, how can Rome be uh, fantasized? Uh, let's see, Rome has battles with barbarians, with Gauls, with uh, Germanic tribes, with uh, Carthaginians, with Persians. And uh, how about, like, uh, from, from uh, the Roman side, uh, what if uh, we had a great uh, centipede um, which the Romans used as uh, assault uh, beasts, and the Germanic side had a dragon uh, fighting for them. Uh, maybe, maybe a dragon coven that helps uh, the German people uh, defend their territories uh, mm -hmm. against the Roman invaders, because dragons are also living in that forest, and German people are also living there, so they might combine their forces. Um, it it came up from uh, th this ideas. We we need to uh, give uh, material for dungeon masters and players uh, to play with. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to uh, so we need to write a history. Uh, we need to tell them about a total fantasy world. Uh, we need to tell which dragon coven's uh, are um, fighting uh, for the Korovian Empire and which dragon coven's are fighting against them. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to tell them, uh, okay, uh, so why did uh, the fantasy version of Rome, uh, in our case, the Korovians, uh, how, why couldn't they, um, why couldn't they invade deep into uh, Germania? And uh, why couldn't they invade deep into Britannia? Mm -hmm. uh, why couldn't they do this? Uh, in, in history, there were, uh, obviously, there were some uh, causes uh, that stopped them. Uh, but in a fantasy world, uh, you need to give similar causes. And uh, also, you need to blend it uh, fantasy. And that has to make sense, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so... If, we don't like to say just like okay these these lands are just uh cursed lands and um, no one goes from there uh okay it's over mm -hmm. uh, no we don't want to do that. we we want to give a uh give a proper um re give proper relations between these fantasy elements and the elements that are inspired from history uh so then that was actually a huge work. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we wrote uh, and then wrote more and then wrote more pages. Uh, and it eventually uh, turned into a setting and uh, we called it the Realms of Armir, mm -hmm. uh, let's say. And uh, this this world is uh, has elements uh, of uh, history and elements of uh, fantasy and uh, we think it makes sense. Uh, of course, it's up to uh, our uh, backers, up to up to other people to mm -hmm. uh, see uh, uh, if it if it really uh, makes sense. If these uh, relations and these uh, fantasy blend blending, uh, but we we think uh, it's an okay. Uh, it's 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 okay. Uh, just uh, like that. So. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we put uh, just a very s a small uh, amount of that information in our demo booklet, mm -hmm. and uh, people can write, keep, people can read very generally about uh, the history uh, of these lands, uh, what happened before uh, the Karovian Empire dominated their lands, uh, what came before them, um, which. Uh, uh, which uh, forces dominated the world uh, before the times of the Karovians, uh, and how did the Karovian Empire uh, became uh, its uh, version 
uh, of today. So mm -hmm. uh, how did it evolve from a kingdom to a republic and then from a republic to the empire? Uh, how did it happen? Uh, we just give a small uh, portion of it or in our demo booklet uh, because uh, the editing of the uh, the editing of the longer version is not finished yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I hope uh, it answers your question, yep. but I don't know. Are, are you happy with it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now, when it now, when it comes to, when it comes to, when it comes to the setup, uh, the big question that I, ha that I feel I inevitably have to ask is on the matter of compatibility. Um, mm -hmm. especially especially since this is still using the fi the five e um, rule set. Mm -hmm. um, are there when it comes to when it comes to just the race class combinations in mm -hmm. van in vanilla five e? Are there any, are there any that you can think of that are pr that would probably be a little bit trickier to justify than others, or is it a, is it a case where you're trying to go human centric, or is everything on the table? Well, um, five e was every time a little uh, some some general rule set that you can uh, use uh, for uh, for any setting. Uh, from the beginning, it was just like it, just just that it was the rules. Uh, yeah, they, uh, Dungeons and Dragons gives us uh, some. Uh, proper races and some proper uh, character uh, builds, uh, some classes, but um, it's it's more than that. There is there is just um, it's uh, you can play with it and you can create uh, new classes. You can create new combinations of uh, races, uh, and they've also uh, shown it at the uh, their latest book like the in tasha's cauldron of everything mm -hmm. uh, they they brought up many options uh for new races or even uh just creating your own race uh so uh from from my point of view uh no one has to uh stick to the classical uh build up of uh five feet not not in the not in the um rules and mechanical terms uh, uh -huh. yeah they, they have to stay uh they have to stay the same uh the same of course to uh, be able to properly play the game but uh the uh, character creation and the uh races uh and all these are yeah can can be can be homebrewed or uh they can be changed uh according to the setting uh, so uh, we we are not very much uh, giving uh, very new concepts mm -hmm. about the uh, race development but uh, of course uh, this is a human our our setting is a human dominated world mm -hmm. uh, and from here uh, we said yeah, we we need to give the players uh, some options to uh, bring the historical people uh, into their characters. Uh, so we need to uh, they 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 need to create a, a Karovian uh, legionary, for example, or mm -hmm. a, or a Germanic mercenary uh, that fights uh, in the empire or. Uh, or a Persian sorcerer. Uh, so how can we do this? Uh, and then we developed the idea of ethnicity uh, mm -hmm. for human characters. Uh, one of our uh, major uh, new concept is this ethnicity feature. Uh, so if you create a, uh, of course it's optional. You don't want, you don't have to do this. You just, uh, you can just. Uh, make a human character as in the rule book and uh, say that he's Persian and uh, it's over. Mm -hmm. But if you want to uh, really have the feeling of this ethnicity, uh, we give new options to the players. So we say um, uh, while character creation, creating a human character, 
uh, you can drop the uh, ability increase um, trait. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, you don't take the uh, give plus one to your all abilities, and uh, we say um, if you do this, uh, your character then may choose an ethnicity. Uh, for example, uh, she can be a uh, Germanic, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, she can be one of the Germanic people. And this uh, gives uh, her specific um, traits uh, related to her uh, ethnicity. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe some maybe some players will not like it, uh, but as I said, it, it's optional. Uh, they don't have to do this, but... Uh, I think that uh, if if a player really wants to enjoy the setting, uh, if a player really wants to um, experience the the feel of being like a Roman a proud Roman soldier or a proud Karovian soldier in mm -hmm. our setting, uh, she will go for our alternative build. Yeah. Now, within the within the set the setup that we ha that. Is um per that is present um like it it is ver it is very much doing a doing a lot of the motifs that we that we would that we would see in um antiquity um but the one of the big one of the big quest one of the big elephants in the room when try when essentially trying to do um Rome meets fa meets fantasy is the magic question. <laughs> for lack of a better term, <laughs> and my qu my query on that my query on that is how pre how um how prevalent is magic? Is it a case where the magic where is it is it a case where most magic users are are I are um isolated either either by either socially or um or by or by their own choice? Is it a case where um where magic where magic use is accepted to the point where there might be ma there might be full on magic users um holding court um in i.e. i.e. might ha i.e. having um senators possi possibly being magic users or or some kind of advisor or is it is it a case where you have um where um there's a matter of interpretation depending on which region in the setting you're t you're discussing Um, something we tell about the setting is that um, magic here uh, is seen uh, very as a very dangerous and uh, a very uh, occult uh, uh, thing uh, or profession to um, to work on. So think about it uh, in the in the real history uh, shamans. Mm -hmm. um, or the real history, uh, the real historical uh, priests. Uh, were they numerous in the real world? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, there, there were very few of them, and they were very uh, influential uh, figures uh, of their tribes of or their kingdoms, uh, but they were also never the rulers uh, of, their, uh, of their settlements, of their nation. Uh, and that is exactly uh, how the magic is handled in Karovia Victor uh, and in our setting. Um, yes, there are magic users. There are a lot, there are a lot of magic users, uh, but people usually uh, either fear them uh, or, depending on their culture, uh, maybe even respect them. Um, but... Um, what is essential is that uh, they are um, they try to uh, keep this lore of uh, magic and uh, this secret their the their secret knowledge to themselves. So they don't very much share uh, what they practice or what they know about actual magic to other people. Uh, firstly, it's because to uh, preserve their secrets to themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, second, uh, to um, to gi give this uh, impression of uh, privileged positions to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in our setting, 
uh, it differs from place to place, but um, if we are to talk about the Korovian Empire, uh, the Korovian, in the Korovian Empire, there is a major guild called, we call it the uh, Concilium Magustrum. Mm -hmm. uh, they deal with all things magical and uh, they have uh, licenses for uh, magicians who are uh, like licensed from the state uh, to properly uh, to properly work on magic uh, there are other rogue uh, spellcasters and mages uh, in the empire and mm. uh, as long as they don't threaten the people or as long as they don't pose a real threat uh, to anyone uh, no one bothers them but the thing is uh, when, as an adventurer when you <clears throat> or as a spellcaster uh, if you're not a licensed spellcaster of the Concilium, uh, uh -huh. you are not welcome to the court of any uh, imperial official. Uh, so mm, no governor or no magister, uh, no consul will uh, talk to you or listen to your demands uh, or even care about it. Uh -huh. uh, but on the contrary, if, if you are from the uh, Concilium, if you are a licensed mage uh, of the Empire, uh, then, yes, they will hear you, they will try to uh, understand uh, what you need and uh, they will even help you uh, because uh, because your license means you are working in favor of the, uh, of the empire. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will not harm the empire in any way, you will not do uh, anything uh, harmful to the empire with your magic. Uh, like you will not raise an army of the dead and attack any imperial town. Uh, they are sure about this, and they're also sure that uh, in any case uh, there's an there's an invasion or there's a problem. Uh, you will try to uh, help uh, the empire uh, as best as you can. Uh, so uh, they're okay with seeing you, with talking to you. Uh, of course, some of them may respect or some of them may fear you, but. Uh, that's pretty much uh, what it's like in the Korovian Empire. Uh, in the Senate um, and among the nobility, uh, there there is a very uh, there, there's a great distinction between mm -hmm. those who can practice magic and those who can't. Uh, and it's like uh, if you are a spellcaster, if you are a magician, um, or uh, let's say it this way: if you if you openly declare uh, your uh, your mage abilities, uh, you you can you are not accepted into the senate. Mm -hmm. uh, you you may be a noble of the uh, empire, uh, you may be a patrician, but uh, if you are a uh, if you are a licensed mage, mage, uh, then you are not welcome in the senate because uh, they think that mm, mages are uh, are very open to corruption uh, while in actually uh, many senators are <laughs> indeed corrupt uh, corrupted politicians uh, they take bribes they uh, they try to gain wealth from mm -hmm. their position uh, but to the public they give the image that uh, yeah mages are uh, we we uh, we don't allow mages to uh, go into uh, political arena, and so uh, uh, you, m many of the people, uh, you don't uh, practice magic. Uh, so we do. Uh, mm -hmm. So also we don't practice uh, practice magic, uh, and our emperor or any senator uh, doesn't practice magic. Uh, so we keep uh, spellcasters and uh, mages out of the senate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, that's how it is. The, yeah, we, you, uh, I I hope you're trying to uh, and our listeners are trying to understand uh, the the conflicts that we are trying to um, uh, put here. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at one side, uh, this is this is what the senators declare, but uh, in actually they they are already uh, most of them, uh, let's say, already very corrupted. 
uh, and evil people who just try to squeeze people to pay more taxes and uh, oh, it's, r- it's rife uh, adventuring well- fodder. Yeah. <laughs> But when it com- when it comes now when it comes to spellcasting itself, um, are there are there are there any um, special rules regarding regarding that regarding magic use within the within the setting? Um, and I'm speaking strictly on the mechanics. There's obviously been some settings that have their own quirks to ma- to match how magic is depicted in their setting. Uh, we will. Uh, we will not put any uh, any um, new mechanic uh, about uh, magic, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, of course uh, we want to reflect uh, the various nature of uh, magic users uh, according to their uh, peoples and tribes. Like uh, some, uh, that there should be a difference between uh, a Karovian wizard. Uh, a scholarly Karovian mm-hmm. wizard and uh, a, a shamanic um, Germanic sorcerer. Uh, so we will try to. We did not have enough uh, pages or enough um, enough time to talk about it in our demo booklet, but we will talk about it more uh, in our complete book on how uh, how how do they differ mm-hmm. uh, from one another? Uh, what are their different goals? Uh, which ways do they practice magic differently? Uh, uh, we didn't want to uh, put a lot of content to the demo booklet and confuse people with many information. Uh, so that's why we didn't put it in the demo booklet. But uh, in the full book, uh, they will all be there. Uh, but again, uh, they are mostly not mechanical uh, and rules-wise issues. They are uh, mostly the the flavor uh, of the setting. Mm -hmm. Now, with that kind of thing in mind, I would like to I would like to ask about the classes and subclasses you're putting in. And I will start with the brand new class that you're putting in, the Flamen. Yes. Oh. Uh, Flaman is actually uh, a, a historical word uh, for priests of mm-hmm. Rome. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to do with the Flaman is um, there is no representation of the uh, ancient uh, Roman priest or an ancient uh, Germanic shaman in um, in Fifi. Uh, in Fifi, yeah, we, yes, we have... A, a, a cleric class, uh, which is uh, which is pretty much the the warrior priest, mm-hmm. uh, uh, let's say uh, the the typical uh, cleric wears heavy armor, uh, takes a shield and a mace uh, at her hand, and uh, while uh, she she casts healing spells to uh, to her companions, and she also smashes the uh, heads of the monsters uh, with her mace. Uh, and this is just uh, way different than uh, we imagine uh, a, a proper Karovian uh, priest uh, should be. Uh, so uh, we want to give. Uh, so then, yes, we said uh, first we talked about representing it as a new cleric domain, but then we said no, this should be a. a definitely new class uh, where where our priest is not uh, armored at all uh, this is this priest uh, does rituals uh, and gives actual sacrifices uh, to the gods mm-hmm. and uh, takes her powers uh, through these rituals and these sacrifices uh, just like uh, the Romans did when uh, at the beginning of a battle uh, they used to sacrifice like a bull uh, to give them to, for the Mars to give them strength. So uh, this is what our Flamen uh, will do. She will not fight from the front line uh, just like a cleric. She will um, she will do rituals and uh, she will sacrifice uh, something to the gods 
uh, to grant her and her companions uh, blessings. Uh, this doesn't mean she's uh, she's not useful in battle, uh, mm -hmm. but she stays mostly at the back and uh, she tries to uh, how to say maybe buff her uh, companions mm -hmm. uh, according to her uh, bl the blessings she received before. Uh, so that's that's very different than the classical uh, cleric. Uh, of course, uh, during our playtests, we um, we talked to our um, playtesters about it, and uh, one of the very interesting um, points they uh, one playtester made was that. Uh, but with the cleric, I can also do that. Uh, she said, uh, "I yeah, my cleric can wear heavy armor, but uh, I may choose not to wear any armor, uh, and I may choose to uh, stay on the on a su more supportive role uh, mm -hmm. rather than staying on the front line. And uh, I can I can already do this with the cleric. Th this is this is an okay approach, but mm -hmm. uh, when you do this, you." you are not using the full potential of cleric mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's something that uh, she chooses to make uh, that's not the classical uh, cleric role uh, so w we said uh, we definitely need to give uh, something uh, new some new class rather than cleric to uh, represent uh, our uh, Karovian priests mm -hmm. and um, also, uh, we are thinking about uh, the subclasses and the archetypes of this class as pantheons, uh, rather than uh, domains, which are very uh, vague ideas, uh, uh, but actual pantheons. So, uh, as a as a flaman, as a as our priest, you will um, you will devote yourself uh, to a pantheon, uh, let's say the Karovian pantheon. Uh, you will devote yourself to it and uh, you take blessing from the Karovian gods and you are not the servant of the uh, Germanic gods. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in the cleric, you you just choose a domain like it's a, uh, it's, it's a light domain mm -hmm. and you, uh, you choose a maybe, maybe if you want to. Uh, if you want to, you choose a uh, uh, god of light or a goddess of light, mm -hmm. and and the, and she gives you some powers. But but actually, this is uh, th this is very uh, up to player. So uh, the domain um, the uh, shapes everything, and mm -hmm. the domain is a very vague term. Uh, it's not explained enough. Uh, yeah. We think. Uh, so we need to make it more strict. So uh, if uh, uh, if a flaman from a, a Persian uh, from a Persian pantheon uh, will have very different uh, abilities and spells or spell-like abilities, mm -hmm. uh, sacred prayers and rituals uh, than a flaman of the uh, uh, of the Hellenic pantheon. All right. Now, the the as a fur, as a further um, setup, would I'm ge I'm guessing that the three subclasses that it that it has are the high gods, the old gods, and the chaos gods. Yes. Um. Mechanically mechanically speaking, um, what would what would e what would each of those archetypes add to the proverbial sandbox? Uh, we we think of high gods as uh, being uh, the 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 gods uh, that uh, that favor the order uh, and civilization uh, in general. So, um, like Car Karovian gods and Hellenic gods are uh, part of these uh, high gods, uh, mm -hmm. and 
it's it's just a uh, it's just a nomination like uh, many people don't even call them high gods but it's our nomination that we call them because the Karovians call them high gods mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, we call them high gods and uh, they they represent the order and the uh, they they are uh, very much favoring uh, battles that are made uh, to defend this order and uh, this civilization. So uh, the, uh, a flamen of the uh, high gods is like a, a bastion of uh, justice, law, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the ideals of bravery. Uh, about the old gods, we uh, we are uh, we are putting the uh, the Gaulic and uh, more tribal uh, pantheons and more tribal gods uh, into their category. Uh, the old gods are uh, are favoring a way of life that is uh, harnessed uh, with nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, don't uh, don't make uh, great walls around your cities. Uh, be one with nature, uh, but they of they are of course they are not uh, the druidic uh, type. Uh, they these gods and uh, and these people who uh, who respect these gods know that they also have to do a small amount of uh, agriculture or uh, they also know they have to uh, do hunting to uh, to live uh, in a in an orderly manner so uh, these guys these gods are not against um, like a settlement uh, that doesn't harm nature very much uh, or a tribal community uh, and that's exactly uh what they like their uh, people to do uh, uh -huh. so uh, these uh the flamens of this these uh, old gods and their pantheons uh they are mostly the ones who uh, who help uh people grow their uh grains uh who help hunters uh find their uh, find their animals uh, who help the people to uh, uh, herd their animals and uh, they yeah, and when in times of war they are also uh, the ones who can uh, who can give uh, the battle abilities of uh, these things uh, to their to their companions uh, so uh, so they can uh, like uh, give the give arrows that will uh, hit very well, mm -hmm. or uh, they can give toughness and resilience uh, to their companions. Uh, that would reflect the way of life of a farmer, or uh, like um, or a woodsman, or a man of the forest, or a, a woman of the forest. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, the chaos gods. These. Uh, they are, uh, how to say, they are uh, both destructive and creative uh, at the same time. Uh, they represent uh, both the forces of the apocalypse and the forces of the uh, creation. Uh, these these guys just don't very much care about uh, how people uh, uh, how people worship them because. They are very essential uh, to the cosmic forces, uh, so uh, they are not interested uh, with people's prayers or worships. But uh, if they if they find someone worthy uh, of their interest of their um, of their choosing, uh, then uh, they send their blessings uh, to this person to become their flamen. And then uh, this flamen of the chaos gods uh, can rain destruction upon uh, her enemies mm -hmm. and also 
uh, can create wonders uh, given the uh, given the given the creative side uh, of these gods. So with them, uh, we think of the titans. We think of the uh, Norse gods who are uh, who are like brutal and uh, who demands harsh sacrifices uh, from their uh, from their followers if they want to follow their ways, but who also reward them with uh, great abilities. Mm -hmm. Now, when it come now when it comes to the um, ar the archetypes that that you've listed, I'll start at the top with the path of the fanatic. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is one of my favorites. What it, and what is that? What does that particularly bring to the barbarian? Well, it brings the uh, the typical uh, naked barbarian warriors of uh, ancient Gaul and uh, Germania to the Fifi. Uh, they are uh, they don't wear any armor. They uh, they only have their shields and their uh, swords, and uh, this is the way uh, of their intimidating uh, their opponents. Mm -hmm. So, next is the College of Senator for Bards. Yeah. And what... And the, the, the College of Senator is uh, actually um for the bards who want to uh, go uh, through the uh, political arena uh, so they will be able to give uh, very uh, good speeches uh, to the public uh, and uh, instead of just uh, instead of just charming one person they will be uh, able to um, like uh, ignite uh, maybe both fear and also courage, uh, depending on what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, within a crowd, uh, the one-on-one -on -one relations are not very much uh, their specialization. They are they are uh, they are politicals. All right, politicians. Now next is the passion domain for clerics. Yeah. Uh, think about the orgy parties of the uh, Roman era, uh, where like uh, slaves and uh, the citizens, they all uh, had sex, uh, they all enjoyed wine and drugs, uh, and then uh, they they thought this would uh, this this would um, calm their souls. Uh, and our passion domain cleric is uh, just this, uh, a cleric uh, that, is trying to, uh, that is trying to heighten the, uh, the very raw, um, the, ver the very raw emotions and passions uh, within someone uh, mm -hmm. and uh, b buffing her allies in this manner. Yep. Um, next the circle of elder trees for druids yep uh circle of elder trees we uh, took inspiration from uh actually the asterix series uh the uh like the old druids uh mm -hmm. of the gold mm -hmm. uh, and we we tried to combine them with the uh the, with the fighting druids uh of the real history uh so we came so 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 born is the uh, circle of elder trees they uh they can make uh, very uh, effective potions uh and uh they can do it because they know um, they can communicate with some elder trees in a forest these trees guide them uh where to find uh, the the greatest herbs or uh, they they even answer their questions uh, if they like. Uh, so with their help, uh, they, they of course they don't uh, go out and do quests for them or uh, like uh, that they are not uh, coming into life and uh, fighting and mm -hmm. fighting in a battle with them. Uh, but 
they give their knowledge to these druids uh, and with this knowledge uh, the, the druid can support its uh, group and uh, create powerful potions yeah now and the la the last one uh, sorry well, I, I was going to say last one, but that's not the case. Next, the um, Gladiator, which I I have my guesses, and it's not the first time that someone's tried to adapt the Gladiator and into the, into into um, fantasy gaming. Right. So I'm curious yeah. as to your particular take. Yeah, our Gladiator is the actual Gladiator that fought that fought in the uh, arena of uh, the Roman Empire, and in our case, the Carovian Empire. Um, yes, as you said, the gladiators uh, are very much represented in uh, games, and they're f like, uh, from a h historical point of view, they are uh, falsely represented. And uh, in the in the films or movies, uh, also uh, or uh, other other media. Uh, they're also fo mostly falsely uh, represented uh, uh -huh. in a in an unhistorical way uh, we mostly see gladiators fighting for their lives like uh like in the movie gladiator we uh, we see russell crowe uh, uh -huh. ki killing like five gladiators in a fight uh no that, that oh, oh man that is that is so incorrect uh gladiators were mostly uh like the, the, the pop stars or the football stars of our age, soccer stars mm -hmm. of our age, uh, they, they were fighting in the arena to cheer the crowd. Uh, their, of course, their fights were uh, tough, uh, but m most of the time, no gladiator died in those fights because uh, losing a gladiator means uh, losing profit for uh, the one who owns the, the businessman uh, uh -huh. who owns the gladiator. Uh, so uh, we wanted to represent this. We we don't want a, a subclass that gives uh, an already uh, an already effective fighter to become more effective at like fighting uh, and slaying monsters, etc. No, we we wanted to represent uh, the qualities that uh, this fighter acquires uh, during its uh, gladiator games and. Um, one of the key features is our distinction of gladiator types. Uh, when you choose the size mm -hmm. archetype, you uh, choose different uh, types uh, of gladiator. Uh, are you a Mormillo? Uh, are you using a sword and a shield uh, and sticking to this type of fighting? Mm -hmm. Or are you a Retuarius? Uh, uh, are you fighting with your net and a trident? Uh, some... Uh, some very uh, typical uh, types of gladiators. Uh, and uh, through this, uh, you distinct yourself. Uh, you say that I'm a glad gladiator and I'm a Murmillo. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not just a, a Russell Crowe gladiator who kills, uh, who kills dozens of uh, gladiators in the arena. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing it as a sport. Uh, but I also uh, can slay, of course. I can also slay monsters uh, in adventures. Yeah, because um, obviously, obviously, somebody who's somebody who's um, who's who's had to who's had to who's had to fight with these kind of weapons and not a whole lot in the way of armor a lot of the time um, is pro is um, is either is either going to toughen up at it or is it or is just get or is just not good or is just um, going to get thrown out of a stable because he's not making any money. Uh, actually, um, gladiators who are famous and who are successful, uh, and by successful I don't mean uh, winning many fights. I mean entertaining the crowd mm -hmm. uh, a lot uh, with their moves, with their uh, dashing styles. Uh, with their manners uh, and their charisma, uh, uh, actually, th these types of gladiators can earn a lot of money. And uh, yes, they are technically slaves, but uh, in reality, it was uh, also like that in ancient Rome. Uh, if a gladiator is uh, famous, uh, it's like 
it's like he's a uh, he's a rock star. He mm -hmm. can do whatever he uh, he or she likes uh, outside of the games. Uh, some did uh, delve into uh, like criminal activities, uh, or others uh, others served as guards to uh, local governors, mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly uh, what our gladiator. Uh, can do uh, yes uh, the gladiator our gladiator uh, learned fighting in the arena mm -hmm. uh, but outside of the arena uh, she can do what she wishes yeah um, and of, co of course the now given given the others I, I don't want to go I don't want to go through all, all of them otherwise we, otherwise we'd be here all day but there is <laughs> one there is one um, uh, there is one other thing I do I do want to focus on, and that is the introduction of this faction system. Um, yes. How did it How did it come about? And tell and tell me what you have planned when it comes to it. Okay, so the factions are uh, pretty much um, they they're already in D and D, but they are in the D and D lore actually. Uh, so people uh, and players who are familiar with the uh, fire on setting with the uh, like novels of Drizzt, mm -hmm. uh, etc they, they they know uh, for example the harpers uh, they know the Lord's Alliance uh, th these are actually uh, factions and uh, th these are our starting points and of course players who are uh, familiar with the uh, Elder Scrolls series uh, knows the factions in these games very well, like the Maid's Guild or the Thieves Guild mm -hmm. or the Fighters Guild, and uh, they they know that if, uh, in these games uh, these guilds are not uh, like classes, uh, but they're like more like uh, like political groups that try to do something, uh, that try to strive for the main uh, goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't gain ranks uh, in these uh, groups uh, just by uh, just by leveling up. You you have to complete quests, and uh, that is actually what brought us to uh, factions in Karovia Victor. We we said yes, this is definitely what we want to see in our game. Um, our players. Uh, of course, they they can play a, any uh, style they wish. They uh, they can just go adventuring and fight uh, fight alongside alongside legions uh, against barbarians uh, or do anything else they like. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, let let's give them something uh, to play on. Uh, let's give some storytelling ideas for them, uh, some new concepts. Uh, and that's when our uh, factions were born. Uh, uh, so our factions are uh, exactly that. They are they are uh, a group of people uh, that are trying to uh, achieve uh, some um, some some main target uh, through their actions, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, they, they are a group of people that are uh, using same methods uh, to achieve this goal. Uh, so far, we have uh, we have written the basics of uh, five uh, factions, and mm -hmm. um, uh, we have written uh, it's nearly finished. The Praetorian Guards, uh -huh. uh, it's in the demo booklet. So um, we give people uh, some some way to deepen their characters. Uh, you, you can just say that, yeah, yes, I'm a fighter, my player, my character is a fighter, my character is a uh, legionary. Uh, but now you can also say yes, but uh, also, uh, in addition, my character uh, is from the Praetorian Guards. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she, has, uh, she has vowed to protect the emperor or any magistrate of the empire. Uh, so she... She defends uh, the imperial goals uh, wherever she goes, and uh, she, she is now uh, a devoted 
uh, an elite trooper of the Karolian empires. Mm -hmm. So, um, so she can also take quests from the uh, leaders of the faction or uh, or other officers of the faction. Uh, when she goes to a new town, uh, maybe she can find the she can find the Praetorian prefect uh, serving in that town or uh, in a in a Karovian uh, legion fortress nearby, uh, and uh, she she can ask if uh, there's something. Uh, that needs to be done. Uh, she may take quests, and the uh, stories may continue uh, from the, this point. Mm -hmm. uh, it 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 will also give uh, storytellers and dungeon masters many new options. Uh, and as her ranks are uh, are going up, she as she gains new ranks, uh, she gains. Uh, new influence and new power uh, in both her faction and mm -hmm. in both the empire. Uh, so when she advances to the rank of a centurion, uh, she can she can now actually uh, maybe uh, ask uh, ask to take some uh, some of the Praetorian guards uh, with her uh, to to aid. Uh, in some quests, uh, maybe for her personal uh, agenda, she can uh, use this uh, this manpower and material uh, to her personal agenda. All right, I I can I can certainly get behind that. I can certainly get behind that. Um. And what? And yes, one more thing I mm -hmm. uh, I want to mention is uh, we have also written some feats. Uh, for these characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, if you're a Praetorian guard, uh, yeah, you can, when, whenever you uh, you will take a feat, uh, you may alternatively uh, take the new feats we have written uh, mm -hmm. for the Praetorian guards. Uh, and they, these are exclusive for uh, this, uh, for those characters of this faction. Yeah. Um, now, when, now, Putting us, obviously these, obviously this, this is get, this is going to be, ex, this is going to be extended through um, stretch, go, through um, writing out stretch goals. But mm -hmm. what, but what, what do you estimate the total page count is going to be? Uh, we estimate it will be uh, around uh, 150. And I'm get, I'm guess, I'm. 150 for just the main the main stuff of Caravia Vic, yes. Victor yes, yes. and um, pro and probably yes. more through stretch goals. Yes, of, uh, exactly. And, and um, with that kind of thing in in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Um, at least for the PDF version. Obviously, getting the thing printed, even if even if even if there wasn't the craziness of the of these days, it would still. There's still the issue of printing is pain. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, uh, we will. Uh, I'm pretty confident that we will finish it by the end of this year, uh, the PDF version. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will do our best to uh, do it sooner. Uh, and uh, very soon, uh, we will we will just print it and send it to our uh, backers. All right, and and with and with with all that with all that in mind, I did want to take this time to offer my congratulations because you guys were only asking for thirteen hundred euro, and you're currently at um at fi at five point one thousand. Yes, thank you, and uh, also this is this is a big thank you from my side and from our team's side. Uh, to our uh, backers, uh, to our great uh, supporters who who believed in us and uh, who trusted us. Uh, this is this is our first project, first big project, and uh, our first Kickstarter. Uh, many people uh, may uh, like. It's very understandable to approach to the uh, to new teams like us uh, with suspicion. Uh, mm -hmm. Will they be able to do it? 
uh, will they be able to uh, give this product on time? Uh, but, well, I think many people uh, showed this uh, support and uh, I want to thank them uh, with all my heart. Mm -hmm. And with all that said, I do want to, I do want to give my sincere thanks for you for for you for being will, being willing to come all the way over to the temple and in, and enjoy the bit of crazy that ha that happens here, even with all the time zone hell. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for having me as guest. Mm -hmm. uh, it was definitely an honor to be uh, at your temple, and uh, my my words echoing uh, through the halls of your temple. Mm -hmm. Um. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether whether it's for, whether it's for more uh, for more of um care, for more of a caravia for um shenanigan shenanigans that have happened at the table, or to, or to la or to laugh at diplomacy in any Rome game past past um past past Rome two, um <laughs> the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah, yeah, we sure like drinking, as the Romans did. Um, oh, when in Ro when in Rome, you do as the Romans do. <laughs> yeah, that uh, you know what that they had actually very funny festivals, and we, we will write uh, a lot of uh, about them uh, in Karovia Victor. Mm -hmm. They had uh, one festival where uh, people were uh, some people were chosen uh, as runners, uh, and they were all naked. Uh, and they were running all around the city, uh, and the people were cheering them. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's some kind of uh, celebration for them. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know that uh, Mark Antony figure uh, from yeah. history, the right hand man of Caesar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in one occasion, uh, we read that he he actually participated in these uh, in the, in this festival. He he was actually a very crazy person. And uh, he just took his clothes off, uh, and in a naked fashion, he ran all around the city, uh, and people just uh, celebrated and cheered him. Uh, there were very crazy uh, festivals and habits uh, of ancient people, mm -hmm. and we want to talk about them, and we will definitely uh, talk more about them, uh, because we, as, as, as you know, uh, we are funded, and we will make this thing happen. Now, with with all with all, but e but even even so, I do of course want to give my own my own sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.